So welcome to Amazon Document DB. So Amazon Document DB is an enterprise ready document database service that scales JSON workloads with ease with MongoDB compatibility. So it would be apt on our part to start off by understanding how does a document DB work and what is document DB and why MongoDB is mentioned here. So I know most of you might be already aware of these things, but let's talk about them for better context. So Amazon document DB with MongoDB compatibility is a database service that is purpose built for JSON data management at scale. This is fully managed and integrated with AWS and enterprise ready with high durability. Okay, so there is a lot of stuff that document DB does and we'll talk about them. So with Amazon document DB, as it is fully managed service, you don't need to worry about the database management tasks such as hardware provisioning, patching, backups or scaling. And the best part as with other managed databases is that it takes backup of your cloud database to Amazon S3. And it also provides point in time recovery and that too up to the second for the last 35 days. So in any case, if you have a problem, your data will be with you. And that's a huge advantage when it comes to data integrity. So let's talk about some of the important pointers that will be very helpful for you. So the storage on document DB scales automatically up to 64 terabyte without any impact, but you pay for only what you use. So that's a very good thing. It also supports millions of requests per second up to 15 low latency read replicas and that too in minutes. And document DB is designed for 99.99% availability and replicates six copies of your data across three availability zones. And as I already told you, it automatically and continuously monitors and backs up your cloud database to Amazon S3 and it enables point in time recovery up to the second for the last 35 days. And when it comes to us developers and architects, we have an advantage with integration as it uh, implements the Apache 2.0 open source MongoDB 3.6 and 4.0 APIs. Now let's talk about why it's associated with MongoDB and uh, how we can migrate our MongoDB workload to AWS document DB. But before that, if you're not aware of MongoDB, you should understand that MongoDB is a source available cross-platform document oriented database program or document database. So you need to understand here that open source and source available is different. So as I told you, like uh, MongoDB is a source available cross-platform document oriented database program. And you need to understand that open source and source available is a bit different. And you might ask me how? So if there is a software and the source is distributed along with that, it can be called a source available for you. But that is more about reading and viewing or modifying the source that is available along with the software. But not necessarily that you're going to contribute to that application because you may read or view or edit it on your own for your own requirements. But the question would arise if you can contribute to the application community, which is the case when it comes to open sources. So that's the major difference that you have. And MongoDB is a NoSQL database that uses JSON-like documents with optional schemas. So that's the reason why it's said to have a MongoDB compatibility. So if you're using MongoDB or for your current platform, then you have a very good option available to you on AWS. Now coming back to migrating MongoDB workloads to AWS, you have your source as MongoDB endpoint. And by making use of the AWS data migration service or database migration service, you can transpose the data that you have onto the target that is your Amazon document DB. So the source is the self-managed MongoDB database. Then you can parse it or transpose it using the database migration service onto the target that is the document DB that is on the cloud. So now let's talk about the MongoDB and let's understand how we use MongoDB but not exactly in depth, but to give you an overall idea of how things work here. So as you can see, we have our document that is JSON. So that we want to work on. So our main objective is to consider that this data or this document as a whole as an object that we will read, write or update or delete. And this is also called a record. Or this is actually called a record. And that is a record in MongoDB is a document, which is a data structure composed of field and value pairs. So just like in the JSON that you have, we have key value pairs here also in the document, we have the same. So we have the field as name, the value as John, we have a field called age, we have the value as 23 
and we have the field as profession and we have the value as engineer so similarly you have the key value pairs and this is basically your record so a record in mongodb is a document which is a data structure composed of field and value pairs and in mongodb we can create a database and once we create the database we can use mongo shell to connect to the database by typing use database command and the place where we store the data is called a collection that is like your table in a relational database in addition to collections we have read only views and uh, on demand materialized views in mongodb which we will discuss later but coming back to collections we can create collections by using the command db dot collection name dot insert one or create index and provide the record that we want to insert so here if the collection does not exist mongodb will create the collection for you so if you see we have db dot my collection that is a collection name dot insert one of the record that i have given and here if this collection does not exist then mongodb is going to create this collection okay so let's see this collection here we have the collection as my collection and we have the record that we want to insert and each of them is a key value pair and once you executed this command on the mongo shell you get the output as acknowledged colon true and inserted id is the object id that you get so you get the uuid as the object id that has been created and once you change or modify the record the id will change for your the id will change for you to identify changes that have been taken place okay so you can see db dot my user my users is basically the collection name dot insert one of the record so this is basically the whole record that we have inserted name age profession and country so once i have given this uh, command and i have executed this i get the acknowledgement that this is successful and here the acknowledgement will be true and the insert id will be given to us in the form of the uuid and you can see that uh, if you are working on a document and uh, this uh, structure that is similar to the json or it is basically the json document so that is why you are going to call this as a type of document database because we are working with the document itself so now that we have seen how we can insert the data and create the collection let's see how we can read the data so we have read operation db.collection.find by using which we can fetch the data as per our requirement so if you see the first example here so db.myusers.find so db.collectionname.find and i'm giving here the age and so what we are trying to do here is we are trying to find the users whose age is greater than 20 and we want to have a limit of five entries so what happens here is i have given the parameter that i want or the uh, field that i want colon and the condition that i'm going to provide here is the dollar greater than symbol or dollar gt that specifies that or that denotes that it is the greater than symbol and uh, the value that it is having is 20 so so i can write it like age colon dollar gt colon 20 which is the condition for age is greater than 20. so once i have executed this i got the value like age is 23 for john so we got the value for this or we got the record here for that particular collection and similarly we have a condition where i can write a query as a string so here if you see db.myuser.find and i have given country colon australia so this is my condition so wherever in the record if the field is country and uh, the value is australia it should return me the value so once you execute this you will get the desired record so josh is one of the users who is of age 22 and is from country australia so this is how i can find but you might ask uh, how we can insert a new record so if i have to insert a new record i can do the same way so like let's create one more object or document so i can do a, a db dot my collection or sorry the collection name dot insert one again and i can add a user or the document like josh 22 software australia and let's suppose i use the find command again to find all the users who have the age greater than 20 and i can limit them to five i'll get both the users so you can see john and josh basically this should be the second step but it's okay uh, so that's what i wanted to show you like yeah if suppose you try to find the users based on a condition you will get that and here as well once you make the insert you will get the object id i just did not show it here but you will be getting the acknowledgement and the object id as well and once you run this find command uh, you will get the result as you want 
Now that we have seen one record at a time, let's see how we can insert multiple records at the same time. And here we can do that by using insert many. So if you see, we have three records uh, like Josh, Jack and Rahul. And you can provide insert many like db.mycollection or collection.insertmany. And within this, you can provide a list of the records that you want. So there are three records within the list. And here, once I've executed them, then I get the acknowledgement equal to true and I'll get the three insert IDs because they are inserted along with each other. So this is like a collection of inserts. So I'll get three object IDs for each of the record. So I hope it was clear. So now that we have seen insert, insert many and read, let's check the update part. So here, if I wish to update the records, I can make use of the update commands or the update functionality that I have. So you can see we have update one, update many and replace one. So let's suppose I want to update many. So what I can do is I can write the command in such a way that db.collection.updateMany and I can provide the condition where age is greater than 20 and I'm going to see or I'm going to add another parameter which actually sets a particular field value. So if I give dollar set, then it takes the parameter of the particular uh, field that is profession and it is going to change the value to DevOps. So this condition actually tells us that for every user who has the age uh, greater than 20, then change the profession to DevOps. And once you execute that, you will get the acknowledgement equal to true. And if suppose the conditions are satisfied, so you'll get the acknowledgement equal to true inserted ID equal to null because this is the update statement and match condition that you have here is count four modified count four uh, matched is like if it uh, satisfies the requirement and it uh, has a matching uh, value that it gets then it will you know, increase the count and it will give you the count of the total values that it has matched and the value that it has modified so if suppose uh, it is like uh, age is greater than 20 so out of out of 10 if suppose 5 have the age as 20 then it will give you like match count equal to 5 and uh, if suppose the profession uh, if suppose it has a profession then uh, it will change it to devops so if you can see here once it has changed so profession is now devops and all the three entries that you have have the age greater than 20. so now we have reached to a point where we can talk about delete so here as well we have the delete operations like delete one and delete many so let's suppose I want to delete all the records with key whose profession is DevOps. Then I can use this db.collection or my collection name dot delete many of the condition that I want to write as profession colon DevOps. So if suppose the profession uh, is DevOps in any of the records, then please delete them. So once I execute this uh, statement, then it gives my the acknowledgement as true and delete count equal to four because there were records and there were four records whose profession was DevOps. Okay, so what do we have here? So this is a minor comparison of how we place relational databases and MongoDB. So tables and relational databases are collections in MongoDB. Same way rows on relational database is documents in MongoDB and columns here are represented as fields in the MongoDB or MongoDB database. So I hope you got the point. So table in RDBMS is collection so imagine that way and rows are basically documents and columns are basically fields. So I hope you got an idea on how things work here. Let's move on. So now let's talk about redundancy and data availability in MongoDB. And my idea here is that if you know these things, then it will be very easy for you to understand when you go for designing applications using Amazon Document DB. So if you feel you're already aware of these things and uh, it is a bit boring, then then also please stick around, it will be a refresher for you. When it comes to replication or data availability, the term replica set is very important. So a replica set is a group of MongoD processes that maintains the same data set. So as we know what replication is, here as well you have data on multiple database instance servers and it provides you fault tolerance if one or more servers do not respond. So how does MongoDB handle replications? So you have your application with a driver to connect to MongoDB and the primary node that you see here is the one that is going to be receiving the right requests. And once the MongoDB sends the right to primary, the operation is recorded in the op log. 
so op log or operational log is also a collection which stores the operations that take place on the database and the secondary nodes that you see here replicate the op logs or the logs that you have and these apply the operations that are being made to the data set so this is a three tier and all the right operations are taken by the primary node and the secondary is actually apply them to the data set so that was for write operations you might ask what about read so here all members in the replica set can perform read operations so you might say the read operation is going to primary in this diagram so the reason is that by default it will get redirected to the primary itself but as a client you can specify the read preference so it's something that you can choose from so we learned about replications now let's understand how the secondary replica set behaves because as you can see we have replications on both sides and these both are secondary so we need to understand how they are basically communicating or how they basically behave so as you know all the right operations are going to the primary and the secondary actually replicates the primary's op log and applies the operations to the data set so the obvious question that comes up is that what happens if the primary gets knocked out or does not respond so what happens to the right operations and who is going to handle them if the primary fails is one of your major questions and this can only be handled and this can only happen in a way as they talk to each other or how we can monitor the health of the instances so you can see we have mentioned heartbeat so what is a heartbeat so heartbeat is a process that identifies the current state of a mongodb node in a replica set and why is it called a heartbeat it's because the replica set nodes send pings to each other every two seconds so if mongodb finds out if the primary is not responding then mongodb automatically switches the secondary to become the primary and that's how it does it but the main question would arise again is how does it do that and how is it doing that how does it automatically switch a secondary to become the primary what are the criteria here now you see what happens here we know what's primary and what is secondary let's suppose the primary fails the replica set that you have starts an election to choose which of the secondaries become the new primary so once the timeout set for the primary fails it creates a trigger and that trigger tells mongodb secondaries to elect one from the secondary to become the primary like this and this is how it manages automated failures i know what you might be feeling and yes that's true the replica set cannot process right information or right process or right operations until the election completes successfully and the way they select the primary is based on which secondary has the highest priority value and which have more votes and based on that they select the primary and but in some cases you may not be able to have a lot of replica nodes so imagine that case study so imagine that in this scenario if you have one primary and one replica then how will you choose the secondary how do we vote so if the primary fails you have one replica that is a secondary so how are you going to vote then and that is where there is a very important or interesting thing that we can discuss so here is the interesting thing so here what we can do is we can make use of a arbiter and what this arbiter is it's just like a friend who will vote for you but wait listen to me first in this situation we add an arbiter to your replica set imagine this to be a node but an arbiter does not have a copy of the data set and cannot become a primary so remember these two things very carefully so the arbiter can be your friend can vote for you but it cannot have a data set or copy of the data set and cannot become a primary so even though it can't be a replica and can't be a primary it can still help you it will help you by participating in the elections for primary an arbiter has exactly one election vote so if it has one election vote it can vote for the only secondary it has so let's suppose this primary fails the arbiter has only one vote and it can vote for this secondary so then in this case you can work with one primary and one secondary as well and that's how it works but as we discussed about how we can use primary and secondary then uh, how do we store data across the nodes that's one thing that we need to talk about and that's where we need to talk about sharding and we need to understand what exactly is sharding so sharding is a method for distributing data across multiple machines in cloud terms you can call this horizontal scaling so here with sharding you can add more nodes to support the growing demands of read and write operations 
so if you see here let us start from the bottom so if you see we have the shards here and these are the replicas that you have that help you to store the data that you want and provide you with the high availability and data consistency and with sharding you add more nodes to support the growing needs of your read and write operations on top if you see we have the application we have something called the routers or mongos so these mongos actually act like a query router and provide the interface between the client application and the sharded cluster so as a query router it helps you to route the query operations that you have and when it comes to managing the configuration or the configuration settings of the cluster you make use of the config servers so the config servers actually stores metadata and configuration settings for the cluster you can have one as well and for better resilience in production we can make use of up to three config servers but there is one thing that we already discussed that uh, on mongodb the data that you have is stored or represented as a part of collections and how does it store them and how does it get routed to the shards is basically with the help of the query router your data on mongodb is stored as a representation of collection and the way it actually stores them and how it actually gets routed to the shards is basically with the help of the query router but how does it actually do that or how does it actually look like so let's check that out so there is one more important point that you need to understand is with mongodb you have both sharded and unsharded collections and we will talk about how it works but first let's start off with the design here so you have your application you want to read and write so with which you want to read and write so here we have the mongos or the routers and let's bring up the two shards that we have and we want to write and read the data from so one thing that you need to understand is that sharded collections are partitioned and distributed across the shards in a cluster and unsharded collections are stored on the primary shard itself and each database has its own primary shard so let's see the sharded collection so this is the collection one and we have the sharded collection so this is how it actually looks like and then we have the unsharded collection that is collection two so as you can see the collections are partitioned and uh, distributed across the shards in the cluster that is collection one and collection two is the uncharted collection so here we need to talk about a few important concepts that will help you understand the things better so the first one is shard keys so shard key is the way we shard a collection that is as mentioned here mongodb uses the shard key to distribute the collections or documents across shards so the way it does is by creating the sharding using the mongo sh method called sh dot shard collection to shard a collection by using the parameters such as key and namespace so the namespace that you have tells you which collection you are pointing at and the key and the key that you have tells you how you want to shard this collection so here as well we have two values the two values are one and hashed so one actually if you give one then it tells us that the shard is range based sharding and if you give hashed then it indicates that it is a hashed sharding so these are the type of shardings that you have and you can read more about them the second one is the shard index key so if you have a sharded collection then you need to know which record is at uh, which shard isn't it so you don't know then it will be very hard to find so for that we need to so for that to identify that we need something called an index so all sharded collection must have an index that supports the sharded key and uh, this can be done by using the same shared collection uh, method so here if you don't have the index it will create the index on the shard key so that's a very good way to identify the data that you have on the collections and the shards third one is chunks where mongodb partitions share data into chunks so it takes a subset or it takes in a subset of sharded data and helps it to get uh, stored in chunks in the shards and the last one that we have is a sharded cluster balancer so just now we spoke about chunks isn't it but for it to balance the amount of chunks in each shard we make use of the sharded cluster balancer so the mongodb balancer is a background process that monitors the number of chunks in each shard so that is how it is able to balance the number of or the amount of chunks that we have in each shard okay so these four points are very important so you can remember them shard keys shard key index chunk and sharded cluster balancer so now that you have some idea about mongodb you are ready to think on the lines of designing your applications with aws using document db and this is how you might work when it comes to using document db 
so let's suppose you're making use of the amazon guard duty or amazon translate or transcribe mostly with the apis that you consume you will get the response as json uh, that could be also be used as your source of the data that you want to process or store as a part of your document db and then you might use services such as lambda eks ecs ec2 to model your data so that it can be used in iot gaming data and you can also use them for your log processing and storage and also for your time series data and once you have stored them in your document db you can query the json data in its natural form without translation and which enables developers to iterate faster and be more productive so that's a very good thing so source is json data you can model them and you can store it and consume it in its raw form or natural format so now let's talk more about what you need to keep in mind while making use of amazon document db for us to start working with document db the first thing that we need to do is begin by creating a cluster so you need to imagine instances of the cluster to be the database instances and a cluster contains or consists of zero or more database instances and you have the cluster volume that manages the data for those instances so remember this very carefully instances of the cluster imagine them to be the database instances the cluster consists of zero or more database instances and you have the cluster volume that manages the data of those instances so the cluster volume is the virtual database or virtual storage volume that is spread across multiple availability zones the best thing is that with virtual database storage volumes you have the option to scale on demand because you need to just attach them and they work in conjuncture with each other and talking about the cluster we need to remember a few points here so a cluster consists of 0 to 16 instances and a cluster storage volume that manages the data of those instances and the primary instance that you see here are responsible for all the writes but for the reads the primary and replicas are responsible both of them and when we talk about the data the data is stored in the cluster volume which is having copies in three different availability zones and don't worry each availability zone will have its copy of the cluster data so if you see here we have two sections one is compute and one is storage so let's start off with the compute first so you see two things here the primary and the replicas so as i already told you before the primary endpoint that you have supports read and write operations remember primary supports both read and write but it is responsible for all the writes as it performs all the data modifications or on the cluster volume and each amazon document db cluster has one primary instance and moving on to the replicas you already know that replicas support only read operations and the cluster can have up to 15 replicas in addition to the primary instance so it is 15 replicas with one primary so total of 16 that's the maximum that you can get so you might ask me why do you need more replicas so imagine a situation where you have a lot of traffic and a lot of demand how will you process the read queries you can manage it with the primary for write but for read you need more replica instances whose task is to give you the data based on your queries that you have so having multiple replicas enables you to distribute read workloads in addition by placing replicas in separate availability zones you also increase your cluster availability that's a very important point and even though az fails you still have an option to bounce back because you have the high availability in place and here the instances you have provides you the processing power for the database which will help you in writing data and reading data from the cluster volume or the cluster storage volume that you have and as i already told you the cluster can have 0 to 16 instances so these are the way like it has been distributed if you see the distributed total volume so even if it is available in three availability zones it has the data set of the cluster replicated across the three availability zones so now let's come back to the storage so here document db cluster uses cloud native storage service to replicate data six way across three availability zones and the best part here is that it uses cloud native storage because it's built for the cloud as it will scale out when the demand increases and has fault tolerance in place and it is optimized for the cloud so it's a very good thing and this solution here provides high durability and available storage and uh, here we have exactly one cluster volume so which can store up to 64 terabyte of data so i hope 
you got the points here let's move on so now that we know how things work let's talk about some of the important pointers that you need to remember for the exam so here the storage volume that we discussed actually grows in increments of 10 gb up to the maximum of 64 terabytes and that is spread across multiple az's so you can support high volume application request by creating up to 15 replica instances so this is actually 0 to 16 including the primary and it runs in amazon vpc so you can isolate your database in your own virtual network the next one is when it comes to handling failures if an instance fails the amazon document db automatically restarts the instances and associated processes and it also has automated failover to one of up to 15 amazon document db replicas that you create in other availability zones so that's a very good thing and here you get an automatic backup retention period of up to 35 days so you can have a restore point to replenish the data that you have lost and when it comes to data encryption you can do that by encrypting your database using keys that you create and control through aws key management service or kms the next one is supported instance classes this is very important for you to know this supports r4 r5 and t3 so this is also based on the region that you have so r4 r5 and t3 and when it comes to monitoring your database or document db you can make use of the aws cloudwatch and cloud trail for the document db api calls and this is like very common because for security mostly you use key management service and for monitoring it's obviously cloudwatch and cloud trail and when it comes to connection endpoints you can make use of the aws management console so connection endpoints in the sense like how we are able to connect to this so you can make use of amazon management console or by using aws cli or the third one is mongo shell 4.0 so you can use all three of them to connect to your document db so amazon document db is also compatible with mongodb 3.6 and 4.0 so that's a very good thing as well now that we know the pointers let's talk about how we can create the connection endpoints and access the document db cluster as a user so that's a very interesting thing let's go check that out so let's talk about how our users can migrate to aws document db from on-premise locations and that's what we are going to discuss now so this is the customer side on-premise location where we have the database which is using mongodb as a source and the customer application so this everything becomes the source for our document database as i already told you in the beginning of the session for migration of mongodb from source to aws cloud we make use of the aws database migration service so that it can help us to transform the data that we have from our source to the document db that is our target so here we have placed our migration task at the public subnet and thus will act as our migration or aws dms replication instance and will help with the replication next is for us to have the migration instance so it will help us dump the data that we have and it will help us increase the number of parallel connections so for now the aws cloud side is done the next thing is about connecting both the source and the target and yes the first option for us is to use the vpn connection from the on-premise so we can connect the source to the target endpoint using this connection and to make it more secure we can enable encryption using kms and for encryption on flight we can have tls encryption in place so this is one way of connecting mongodb source to your target document db cluster and now there is another option that you can make use of that is instead of using vpn you can use the direct connect service so having private connectivity using this as well so instead of using the vpn connection you can make use of the direct connection so i hope you got some idea on how things work in simple terms and so i hope you got some idea on how things work in simple terms and this may be way too much information that you need for the exam but for your experience or real-time experience or learning purpose i hope it has helped you in this and that's all for the document db side i hope you enjoyed it let's move on